This is an NBC News special report. Here's Lester Holt. Good day. We're coming on the air with breaking news. A verdict has been reached in the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse, the 18-year-old who is facing charges for fatally shooting two and wounding another during demonstrations in Kenosha, Wisconsin in August of 2020. The trial obviously has captured national attention. Rittenhouse facing charges that could send him to prison for life. Let's go into the courtroom now live. Would you um, ask, um, give your jury number, please? 54. 54. And uh, has the jury reached a verdict as to each count of the information? Yes, we have, Your Honor. Uh, one verdict and one verdict only? Yes. Would you hand all of the paperwork to the bailiff, please? This is the ones that we did in the office. Okay. Uh, everything. Okay. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> May I see that too, please? Uh, this is oh, I'm sorry. Chairman, thank you. Face the jury and hearken to its verdicts. State of Wisconsin versus Kyle Rittenhouse. As to the first count of the information, Joseph Rosenbaum, we the jury find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the second count of the information, Richard McGinnis, we the jury find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the third count of the information, unknown male, we the jury find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the fourth count of the information, Anthony Huber, we the jury find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. As to the fifth count of the information, Gage Grosskreutz, we the jury find the defendant, Kyle H. Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. Members of the jury, are these your unanimous verdicts? Is there anyone who does not agree with the verdicts as read? No. Uh, would you wish the jury pulled? No. Okay. Uh, okay, folks, your uh, job is done, and uh, we started just about three weeks ago. And I, uh, I told you it could last two weeks and two days. This is, two week this is three weeks. Uh, you were a wonderful jury to work with. You were punctual. You were attentive. Um, and the forgotten six over here who had a, a, a very difficult job of uh, keeping from discussing the case during the time that they were sequestered as well. Better jury to work with. And uh, it has truly been my pleasure. Uh, you've, I think, uh, without commenting on your verdict, the verdicts themselves, just in terms of your um, the attentiveness and the cooperation that you gave to us, uh, this justifies the confidence that the founders of our country placed in you. So um, I dismiss you at this time. You're never under any obligation to discuss any aspect of this case with anyone. You're welcome to do so as little or as much as you want. Uh, the media have requested, a number of media sources have requested the ability to talk to you, and uh, they have been uh, allowed to present uh, presentations to you that you'll get in writing, and it's entirely up to you whether you want to contact, contact them. They are not to contact you. Um, if anyone does contact you and just, you know, Tell them you're not interested in discussing it, if that's the case. Um, and if anyone persists in doing so, uh, report that to us and it will be addressed, I assure you. Uh, at the beginning of the trial, uh, there was some concern about uh, information and, uh, uh, and your safety. And I assure you that we will take every uh, measure to ensure that, that is, uh, your concerns are addressed and respected. Um, and um, I'm going to talk to you for just a minute, not about anything to do with the case, but just about that sole issue. And um, um, 
asking you, as I say, you're welcome to discuss the case as little or as much as you want. Um, and uh, any questions, anybody? Thank you so much. And uh, you're, um, you're, after four years, you're eligible for service again. <laughs> it would be my pleasure to work with you. Thank you. Judge Schroeder uh, dismissing the jury. This case is over. Uh, Kyle Rittenhouse found not guilty on all five counts he faced in the shooting deaths of two men, the wounding of another uh, during protests, uh, social justice protests last year in Kenosha, Wisconsin. We want to go right to NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. He's there. He's been covering this case from the start. Uh, tell us what the reaction you're seeing right now is, Gabe. Well, hi there, Lester. As you mentioned, Kyle Rittenhouse found not guilty on all counts. A small crowd of demonstrators that has really been here throughout most of the trial is also here within the past few moments. We have seen supporters of Kyle Rittenhouse say, free Rittenhouse, and also the Second Amendment is alive. And Lester, that is a theme that has run throughout this case. The jury apparently uh, siding with the defense, which argued throughout this trial that Kyle Rittenhouse came down here to Kenosha to protect the city from rioters and that he only acted in self-defense once he was attacked. Of course, the prosecution had made the argument that you shouldn't be able to claim self-defense if this is a danger you helped create, essentially arguing that Kyle Rittenhouse was the aggressor. But this jury of 12 sided with the defense. Again, Lester, that Kyle Rittenhouse acted in self-defense. He is now found not guilty. You saw him inside that courtroom breaking down in tears, hugging his attorneys. But after a trial that lasted uh, almost three weeks, the jury coming back with this verdict after about 24 hours of deliberations. There were three people shot, Gabe. So the, the defense had contended in each of those cases that Kyle Rittenhouse feared for his life, that the others were the aggressors. Yeah, that's exactly right. Three people were shot. Two of them were killed. The third person who was shot and wounded, Gage Grotzkois, actually testified earlier on in this trial. He was one of the prosecution's witnesses. Some legal analysts saying that some of his testimony actually ended up backing up the defense's claim of self-defense. Uh, but this is a trial that got a lot of attention here in Kenosha and really around the country as testing the limits of self-defense. And for those who may not have been originally familiar with this case, this all happened during the unrest that followed the police shooting of a black man, Jacob Blake. Rittenhouse coming to Kenosha from his home in Antioch, Illinois, just over the state line, and bringing an AR-15 style rifle. Now, Lester, he originally was charged with more counts, and at one point during this trial, the judge actually dismissed the sixth count of gun possession by a minor. The defense arguing that Wisconsin law did not apply to long barreled rifles. And so that count was dropped. Some legal analysts say that that count uh, perhaps was the prosecution's best chance of a conviction, but they did not have that. That did not go to the jury. They were deliberating on five felony counts, the most serious of which is a, was first degree intentional homicide. And as you mentioned, Lester, if convicted, he faced the possibility of life in prison. But again, the jury siding with the defense, finding Kyle Rittenhouse not guilty on all counts. And we note, of course, those on the courthouse steps behind you. Can you characterize the crowd, uh, how the crowd may have reacted at the verdict? Uh, yes, Lester, behind me, there's there's been a small contingency here outside the courthouse uh, each day, and uh, many of them were actually supporters or family members of Jacob Blake, the man who was uh, shot and paralyzed in that police shooting. Uh, they were here each, uh, each day, uh, several supporters of Kyle Rittenhouse as well, and supporters of uh, gun rights uh, had actually been outside this courthouse. Uh, there have been a few minor skirmishes, a few arrests outside of the courthouse, but Lester, the temperature here in Kenosha uh, in terms of unrest is much different than it was last summer when all these events unfolded. Many of these, most of these demonstrations have been peaceful, but still, Lester, there had been a tension over the city just this week. Several schools had switched to virtual learning in anticipation of a possible verdict. The governor had authorized several hundred National Guard members to be on standby. They were never deployed, but there was a lot of um, 
uh, there was some tension here and a lot of preparation uh, by local authorities to not to have a repeat of what had happened last summer uh, during uh, the initial unrest following the shooting of Jacob Blake. But again, right. the reaction here, Lester, uh, just some... Um, just some uh, minor reactions saying, uh, you know, uh, supporting the Second Amendment from those who are happy to see this verdict and who supported uh, Kyle Rittenhouse with the jury finding him not guilty on all counts. All right. Lester. Gabe Gutierrez, thank you. We'll be coming back to you. But right now, joining us is former New York federal and state prosecutor Tally Fahedi and Weinstein. She's also an NBC News legal analyst. We appreciate you being with us. Uh, First, if you, if you can address the whole issue of, of self-defense, is that often successful or as it was in this case? It is not often successful the way it was in this case. But, Lester, it's important to note that Wisconsin's self-defense law is pretty much standard in putting the burden on the prosecution to disprove self-defense. And that's the theory that the jury clearly bought here. The the prosecution was criticized at times for many onlookers for the way it conducted the case. Uh, do you, when we look at this case, are we going to look at the performance of the prosecution, or just did the facts simply not make a case uh, that argued against what Rittenhouse was saying? No, I think when we sit with this verdict, what we are going to look at is the really dangerous combination of liberal self-defense laws, like the ones in Wisconsin around the country, and the accessibility of guns. Because in the end, his argument, which prevailed, was that his own gun, Kyle Rittenhouse's own gun, is what put him in danger and what justified him using deadly force. If he had not had that gun in his hand, then he would not have been in a position to invoke this self-defense theory. And I think we're going to be sitting with that toxic combination of self-defense and the proliferation of guns for a really long time. The, the prosecution had made the argument in their closing arguments that you can't provoke something and then claim it was self-defense. Maybe you can. Is that, is that what this says? It says that, uh, at least in this case, the jury read provocation really narrowly. Uh, so they did not accept the theory that him just being there with a dangerous weapon was provocative. And I think when they broke it down with each of the three victims, they stepped into his shoes and they agreed agreed with Rittenhouse that he was in danger and that he was justified in taking the violent actions that he did. And, and how do you think uh, the, 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 the social impact of this will be? Is I, it's probably hard to read, uh, but a lot of folks will take what they want out of this, uh, out of this verdict. That's right. It was polarizing going in, and it's going to be polarizing going out. You know, we just heard in your report about uh, Second Amendment activists already being on the ground there uh, in Wisconsin. And I think hanging over this is also a Supreme Court case that's currently pending about whether states can be as restrictive as some of them are, as New York is, in prohibiting people from having concealed handguns. And, uh, you know, this, this verdict and this whole episode is a lesson. Uh, that may well bear on decisions like that coming down. Telly, I'll ask you to stand by for a second and just to remind folks who may be joining us, uh, not guilty on all counts for uh, Kyle Rittenhouse in uh, the killing of two people and wounding another during a protest last year in Kenosha, Wisconsin. As we continue our coverage of that, joining us now is uh, Georgetown School of Law professor and NBC News legal analyst Paul Butler. Paul, great to see you. Uh, your early observations and thoughts at this verdict. Uh, the not guilty verdict means that the jurors believed Mr. Rittenhouse's use of force was justified. They found that he reasonably believe that each of the three people he shot posed a deadly threat. And it also means that the jurors found that Mr. Rittenhouse was not the aggressor. He didn't provoke any of this and, in the eyes of the law, is now a victim. Lester, I think Mr. Rittenhouse probably won this case by taking the stand. He had a constitutional right not to testify. But when the defense is self-defense, jurors want to hear a story. Mr. Rittenhouse's narrative was that the first person he killed followed him and tried to grab his gun, the second attacked him with a skateboard, and the third person he shot pointed a gun at him. The jury looked at the video, the testimony, 
And apparently it found reasonable doubt that's the standard for a not guilty verdict. The prosecution lost on some points that it things it wanted to do, things it wanted to say. Do you think any of those really came into play ultimately? You know, there were concerns throughout the trial that the judge tipped the skills in front, tipped the scales in front in favor of Mr. Rittenhouse, including by excluding some evidence that the prosecutors thought was really probative. They had a video of Mr. Rittenhouse beating up a teenage girl, another video of him looking at people he thought were stealing from a CVS drugstore and saying, man, I wish I had my gun. That might have made a difference to a jury, but the judge thought that it was inadmissible. Based on the verdict, concerns about the judge and the prosecution will go away. When a defendant is found not guilty, the verdict is final. The prosecution cannot appeal. So those concerns will go away in a legal forum. I think that there are some people who will not have confidence in this verdict, Lester, based on those concerns about the prosecution and the judge. There was video of these confrontations, but also ultimately, is the jury not simply asked to go inside the mind of the individual, what they thought, what they perceived as, as a threat? So the jury has to do two things. One, it has to find that Mr. Rittenhouse himself actually believed that he faced a deadly threat from each of the three people who he assailed. And second, that that belief was reasonable, that another reasonable person would have had the same concern. And so in accepting Mr. Rittenhouse's self-defense, the jury was either persuaded by him, or maybe they thought the evidence probably favored the prosecution, but probably is not good enough if it's, if it's a criminal case. The standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt means that the jury has to be around 95 percent certain. All right. Uh, thank you. I want to go to Washington Post columnist Eugene Robinson to give us a little bit of the bigger context. And the context, of course, this was all taking place, uh, Eugene, during uh, a protest over the, the shooting uh, of a black man mm -hmm. by police. When you, when you look at that bigger context, will this always stand apart or will this be a case that's strictly about self-defense? Well, it stands a bit apart, Lester, but it's not strictly about self-defense, in my view. I mean, it, it, there is the issue of how the prosecution presented its case. Had the prosecution presented the case all along that it presented in its closing arguments, namely that the people uh, Kyle Rittenhouse says he perceives as a deadly threat. Actually, the reason they were coming at him was they perceived him as a deadly threat because he had this huge military-style weapon and was running up and down the street, and they were just trying to, in effect, protect themselves. But the prosecution didn't really make that case. They argued it in closing arguments. And, and then, of course, uh, the, the judge in this case has a long history of being pro-defendant, you know, look, in our legal legal system, if you want a judge to lean one way or the other, you want the judge to lean toward all defendants rather than leaning toward all prosecutors. So, you know, it's, so there are unique things about this case. What, I, what concerns me, though, is that the result will be seen as a vindication of vigilantism of, of what Kyle Rittenhouse was doing, the larger context of what he was doing, uh, you know, during these demonstrations over the shooting of, of, of Jacob Blake, uh, he came across state lines carrying a military-style assault weapon um, with the with what end? What aim? What end uh, to to protect? property that he had nothing to do with when his property, uh, there were police on the scene, uh, you know, duly authorized and trained uh, law enforcement officers who were prepared to handle whatever situation arose. Yet he came in, uh, you know, appointing himself as, as, uh, as some sort of enforcer. Uh, and to the extent that this legitimizes that line of thinking, that line of action, I think it's very dangerous and, 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 it, and it's very worrisome going forward. Uh, you know, it's, this is, a, this is a, a divided country on hair trigger on a lot of issues, uh, and it's a country in which there are more guns than people. Well, uh, you, and 
<laughs> I'm just going to say you touch on a lot of points that are going to be the topic of a lot of conversation going forward based on what has happened today. And we'll be getting into all that tonight when I see you on Nightly News. That concludes our coverage of the verdict in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. Again, not guilty on all counts. We'll have much more, as I said, tonight on NBC Nightly News. For now, I'm Lester Holt, NBC News, New York. Good day. All right.